The uh, topic of our panel tonight, our big questions session, could hardly be more appropriate given the, uh, the goals and vision that I laid out for the college just a moment ago, which in many ways ties together our interest in community, both in the sense of reaching out to our community, in the many, many ways that people in the liberal arts study community and in, in defined in, in many, uh, many different ways, and our, our desire to help improve and build communities by uh, helping our students be the absolute best, uh, most desirable graduates that they can be. So all of that is about community. And in our panel tonight, we're talking about polarization in our many communities, something that we hear a lot about, have heard a lot about over the, uh, over the recent years, uh, something that has, I would say, many uh, Americans, certainly, and we can think about polarization around the world certainly has many Americans concerned about the, the nature or the state of their society and their politics. So over the course of the year, we will be doing several of these big questions segments that are tied to the grand challenges. And the way we look at this at CLA is that one of the things that we do is that we ask the big questions before the grand challenges begin to be investigated. So one of the big questions underlying creating vibrant communities is exactly the nature of polarization how important is it? Do we need to worry about it? Is it something that we need to think about in terms of creating uh, those vibrant communities? We're fortunate to have with us a wonderful panel, uh, State, uh, State Senator Scott Dibble, Joel Kramer, CEO and uh, editor of MinPost, Elaine Tyler May, who is Regents Professor of History and American Studies, and John Wright, Professor of African and African American Studies and English. Please welcome them. So let's dive right into the question that is motivating tonight's discussion. Is the widely held belief that society is becoming more polarized based in fact or merely a, a matter of perception? I'll ask each of our panelists to respond to that briefly. And Senator Dibble, let's start with you. Um, well, um, I'm going to answer like a politician does. and. Uh, answer both sides of the question, I would say that there is uh, certainly strong evidence that we are becoming more polarized. Kind of the corollary question, the question that uh, occurs to us, uh, that we hear a lot of course, is are we uh, the most polarized we've ever been in our history? And I think the answer to that is clearly we're not. Uh, we're not in the midst of a civil war. I think that's pretty abundantly clear that uh, we were a little more polarized back in the 1860s. Um, uh, but I'll say, you know, I, I of all people uh, can attest to um, a tremendous amount of polarization in terms of partisanship, uh, the nature of uh, political rhetoric. Uh, you see how extremism and anti-intellectualism pass as mainstream political speech these days. Uh, you see uh, Congress that has been the least productive Congress ever. Uh, you see uh, 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 state government shut down. Uh, you see important measures passing on strict party line basis, measures that uh, have a lot to do with the public good. On the other hand, on the flip side, of course, um, uh, I can also attest personally, families like mine can get married now. Um, that's a tremendous achievement, a tremendous coming together around a key issue that was uh, very divisive a uh, short while ago. Yes. Um, uh, you see the evidence of uh, the millennials uh, that give me great hope, uh, who uh, embrace diversity even in their own personal spheres of, of friendship. I have two younger brothers who are millennials, and uh, their peer groups are as diverse as our country is, and they don't even think twice about that. Um, so you see also um, uh, just a, 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 I think what we see is we have a, a political system and, and elective offices and the like that are somewhat out of phase with some larger trends that are going on in our, in our larger country. Um, but uh, we have income disparity uh, the, at the greatest point in the last 100 years. That's cause for concern and will lead to ever more polarization. And we see some of the influence of social media that gets us into kind of an echo chamber of our own that might take us apart from each other. So we have some trends to guard against. Um, and I think we have something, some, some pendulum swinging back to, to correct in our political system. Um, we're becoming more polarized, but we've got some, some efforts to mitigate against that. Joel? I think our political system is more polarized than certainly in the last 50 
years or so. But I think that's mostly a matter of the parties sorting themselves out. I remember when I was growing up in the 50s, you know, Southern Democrats were a lot more conservative than Northern liberals in places like New York where I lived. And that is no longer true. The most uh, liberal Republicans uh, are more conservative now than the most conservative Democrats. The parties have sorted. That's not necessarily a bad thing in parliamentary systems. That is the way uh, parties work. Uh, I think the real problem in our politics in this country is not so much that, that it is more polarized, but that it is paralyzed. And I think that is partly a result uh, of the loss of the art of compromise. And uh, people who disagree with each other uh, in a democracy have to figure out a way to achieve solutions together. And that is not working well in our country right now. And one of the things I'm most concerned about uh, is that our system does not function very well at a time when, uh, when people are not willing to compromise. It's not like a parliamentary system. Eric Black has written a lot about this in MinPost recently in comparing governments around the world. In a parliamentary system, if, if people don't agree with each other, they have a process for working through who's in charge, who gets to make decisions, and then you can throw the bums out and put somebody else in charge. Our system right now, I think, is paralyzed and is not able to function in this uh, time of great uh, uh, lack of, of compromise. As far as the public is concerned, however, I don't really believe we are so terribly polarized. Some research suggests a little more ideological cohesion in the public than there uh, used to be, maybe 50 years ago. But for the most part, the vast majority of people don't have strong, consistent ideological positions. I think um, uh, the problem is that people who want to get things done don't find any representation in the community, any way, any party to work with, or any system uh, to engage in that, to be active politically. Uh, and I think that is a, a, a great uh, loss for our uh, country right now. The thing I am most worried about, more than polarization, is the disengagement of the middle 60 or 70% from the political process, uh, their disengagement even from media. Uh, and their uh, basically frustration with the idea of being public citizens, uh, which is leading them, and this is kind of the high way of describing it, is leading them to not be as interested. Another way of looking at it is that our educational system is failing to educate civically engaged and knowledgeable people. But whichever it is, or whether it's both of those, I think the largest problem facing the country is that the middle 50 to 60 percent is not very actively engaged in the job of being uh, political citizens. Professor May? Well, I would agree with um, both of the previous commentators in pretty much everything. And uh, I think that one way to think about polarization is to really question that concept at all. You know, what are the poles we're talking about? I, I don't think that polarization is the most useful way to think about the way our society is arranged right now. I think it is more useful to talk about fragmentation. Dean Coleman, you talked a lot about communities, plural, and of course, we'll always recognize multiple communities. But I think that our, our democracy is the healthiest when all individuals within the communities have a real commitment to the public good and the common good. And I think that we have lost that in recent years. And, um, and we see that in a lot of ways. I mean, probably the crudest measure is faith in, in government. I mean, if the government is what expresses our sense of what the common good is, you know, that's been on the decline for, you know, many, many decades, half a century. Early 1960s, a time of tremendous division in the society, 75, 80% of Americans when polled said that, you know, the um, they had a faith in the government doing the best for the citizens of the country. Fifteen years later, in the early 70s, by the early 70s, mid-70s, after Vietnam and Watergate, that was down to 25%. And it's only risen above that in times of crisis, like right after 9-11, and then that dissipated. 
So I think you can see in a number of measures that we have a, a problem with a society that is no longer committed to a sense of the common good, and that is what erodes our democracy and, and leads to fragmentation. Professor Wright. Um, as uh, someone who was a student, an undergraduate student and a graduate student, migrated from the, the sciences to the uh, arts and humanities and then history and the social sciences, I, uh, along the way, learned that one of the things to do when facing any question is to question the question. Uh, which, <laughs> uh, in this context, right, take me back to, again, my, one of the first courses I took in philosophy. And the question is framed is a question uh, at one level is about uh, how do we know anything? How do we distinguish uh, fact from perception, reality from illusion? What are the ways of knowing open to us, and how do we employ them? I mean, are we, are, we, are we dealing here with something that, which is essentially a 21st uh, analog of, of, of Plato's cave, right, with a group of prisoners whose lives have been spent uh, chained to the wall in darkness, and uh, who see shadows on the wall as the only sense of what, in fact, uh, reality is, and who, until they're somehow freed, um, have no other conception of what the world around them is. Um, how, to distinguish, again, the, the fact and the reality of, of polarization um, you know, raises a number of questions. I mean, the question also does not modify the word polarization. It doesn't say political polarization. It doesn't say religious polarization. It doesn't say social polarization. It doesn't say racial polarization. So it, it's open in a variety of ways to, to inquiry for us. And one of the things, one of the ways in which I guess I approach the spirit of this evening um, is uh, in the spirit of some of the other big questions conversations that have taken place at colleges and universities elsewhere in the, in the country. We're not the first to try this enterprise. But in other contexts, this distinction has been made between asking big questions and asking hard questions. Uh, distinction being that hard questions presumably are questions that can be resolved by appeals to expertise, the kind of expertise that we in the academy are used to wielding. Um, and that big questions, on the other hand, may not be resolvable by expertise, but that are questions that invite dialogue and exchange, um, that explore, again, the different kinds of vantage points from which we view or attempt to view reality and illusion. So uh, <laughs> my orientation to the question begins there with questioning it in those terms. And I'll be glad to elaborate on some of the issues again, because again, the, uh, by the panelists here have raised questions and specifically about the political and social dimensions of polarization. One of the things that we hear in, when we hear discussion of this issue and the, the panel has raised a number of different ways of, of thinking about it. Now I will say even with all the different positions that have come out, I'm not sure that I heard anyone say polarization, conflict, uh, sorting, whatever term you want to use for different aspects of this issue. I don't think I've heard anyone say, you know, there's actually something good about that. There's something that it contributes to a democratic life to have these very strong uh, positions being, uh, being voiced to, for people to know that someone represents them and, and in fact will dig in their heels, uh, as opposed to, one could say, would the opposite of this be a kind of go-along consensus that people agree to look, to look the other way? So I'd like the panelists to think a little bit about that. What do we gain from polarization and division and conflict, however one wants to, to define it? I'd say, well, politically, I think there is an advantage to a society to have uh, partisan sorting. I think it enables you to decide which group best represents your views, align yourself with that group, and work through that group to get things done. I think the problem we have with that right now is twofold. Number one, we only have two parties that have any meaningful role to play, and in fact, 
the range of views that have any uh, clout or, or influence in American politics today is remarkably narrow. Uh, for example, all the, both parties and just about all the commentators you know, presume the uh, sanctity of private property, and we have no socialists, for example, uh, you know, with any influence in the United States. Uh, there are many other kinds of political views, I'm talking about politics now, that uh, people would sort themselves and identify with different groups if there were more groups and if the groups meant something significant. So I think sorting can be good, but sorting only works if you then have a system for you know, counting heads and deciding how to govern. And right now, that's what I, I don't think we have. I would go farther than that, actually. Um, rather than simply sorting ourselves and finding ourselves aligned with whoever represents our feelings. Um, I think that really a vibrant democracy requires much more active engagement in the political process, even if it means pouring into the streets and, you know, calling for change, as happened in some of our most, um, you know, our years of, of most upheaval and dissent and conflict in this society. I think that's how things actually do change. And I think complacency, when people just sort of retreat back into their shells and just say, well, it's hopeless, or I have, you know, I have to get a job and I don't have time for this, or uh, people feeling beleaguered and discouraged, um, you know, that doesn't represent a healthy democracy. And I think the question you raised about, is it a bad thing? Well, it depends, again, what we mean. If we're talking about congressional gridlock, obviously that's a terrible thing. But if we're talking about you know, real vibrant conflict over the issues that are most pressing in our world, whether it was civil rights or if it was feminism or if it was whatever it was, um, you know, it was only by the absolutely passionate engagement of citizens pushing, not following, pushing their leaders that anything really changed. Um, I think it's indisputable that um, the, the strength, the, uh, the ongoing strength of our country, and I think the reason uh, we continue to be such a strong uh, presence, uh, you know, in terms of, of creating agency in our own lives as well as on the international stage, even in the face of the growing uh, kind of economic disparity that, that I think is very threatening, um, is, abs is, is diversity and diversity of ideas and the constant reintroduction and introduction of, of new people here uh, and, and the, you know, the ability for folks to bring new thoughts, new art forms uh, and creativity uh, to our lives, whether it be cultural life or, or uh, you know, university life or you know, inside the halls of, of corporate power. Um, I was just reflecting on that uh, with the passing of Leigh Kamen uh, a few days ago and uh, listening to him talk about the origins of jazz. We wouldn't have jazz if we didn't have a diversity of people coming together, jazz of course being having its origins uh, with African people uh, come bringing their music over as slaves and then that mixing with uh, other, other cultural influences or the, uh, there was some discussion on the radio about the origins of, of Southern rock uh, and how uh, uh, white and black artists came together uh, in, uh, you know, uh, Memphis and, and other cities. Um, you know, it, it creates a, a melding um, through the differences, uh, through the contest of ideas, uh, where you get more from the sum. Um, so without a doubt, diversity, conflict of ideas, um, a coming together then around uh, new ideas has been, and then the constant renewal, new people coming to this country. And there's inherently stress and tension and static and conflict uh, when new folks arrive, um, but it always adds something vibrant. Look at Lake Street and the revitalization of Lake Street, for example, um, but all the trouble um, those, those new arrivals have had on that path to revitalizing Lake Street. Professor Wright, did you want to? Uh, this thing that we call democracy is a work in progress, it has always been so, and Part of the issue from, from the, the outset um, has been uh, to create a genuine dialogue, a comprehensive dialogue, and to uh, hear the voices of all those who are, again, presumably part of this 
experiment we've been engaged with. Part of the history of the country, and it's when the expansion of, of freedom has uh, involved the expansion of the range of voices, of conflict, of intense dialogue and debate. And uh, you know, from my own vantage point, I think that the, uh, the, the central place of dialogue, exchange, polar and otherwise, um, has to be part of what we see as the, you know, what, what, what ensures at least some of the health of the society at large. I want to address a question to, to Joel and Double in, in your own particular areas. So thinking about media, thinking about campaigns and elections, are they helpful in resolving, processing, giving voice, or are they creating more responsible, in your view, for further perpetuating the paralysis that both of you have talked about as being, being one of the offshoots of this conflict that even if the conflict per se isn't problematic, the paralysis is? Yeah. Well, I'd say the, you know, the fragmentation that uh, Professor May talked about uh, has a very good side to it in the media, and that is the fragmentation is a form of democratization. And back, you know, say in the 1950s, uh, when everyone listened to Walter Cronkite or a few people listened to his competitors, the anchors on the evening news, but basically almost everyone in, in the country got their news from these three institutions, and it created a great deal of shared understanding, but it, was, uh, it left out a lot of stories. And today, really no story is left out if, in the media if you use the broadest definition of the media. On the internet, you can hear every story. Every uh, person is empowered to tell their own story. It can be multiplied by other people finding appeal in it. And this, I think, is an extraordinary change. It has weakened the brands that have dominated the media in the past. And I think there are negatives to that because some of those brands, like, for example, the New York Times, invest a lot of money in trying to uh, analyze and report on what's going on in a way that the individual bloggers cannot do. So the brands uh, are weakened and therefore they have less resource to spend on things that I believe matter. I'm a journalist and I think it is important to invest money in investigative reporting, analysis, and so forth. And that is clearly weakened by this fragmentation. But on the other hand, far more voices are heard. You don't have to put in 20 years in the office in order to become a power in the media today. You just have to have a voice that other people follow and that gets spread around on Facebook. And I think that is a, a positive thing. As far as the effect of the media on the political situation, I actually tend to think that most people overweight uh, what the media accomplishes and, and uh, gives either too much credit or too much blame. There are a lot of conspiracy theories about the impact of the media. I think the media is mostly a mirror, and it, it is not really the creator of our politics and our societal values. And uh, I think that uh, clearly uh, the media tends to favor conflict over resolution. I think that's a bias uh, in media, and that can sometimes give more uh, stage time and more voice to people who are looking for conflict rather than looking for solutions. I think that can be a weakness. But on balance, I would say that the broader range of media sources is a good thing, and uh, it's what people do with it that really is important. Um, so uh, campaigns. It, not, not all campaigns and not all campaigning and campaign modes are created equal. This is another way of my answering the question in both ways. Um, so. Uh, Couple of couple of points to make. One is, um, if you look at uh, the campaign um, that defeated the anti-marriage amendment, uh, as well as the anti-voting amendment uh, here in Minnesota two years ago, um, that campaign really didn't rely a lot on TV um, or you know purchased media. Um, it really relied on um, earned media, so telling stories. Uh, in the in the papers and, and on TV, uh, but it really it was an, it was radically and intentionally interrelational. It was about literally millions of stories being told one on one, 
um, so that there was a, a bridge could be built between people on a common set of values so people could see their own story in the issues that were being discussed so they could see themselves in someone whom they perceived as different from themselves previously. Uh, and it worked. It was, it was very, very powerful. We ended up figuring out we had more values in common than divided us and that um, those things are the most important things in our lives, love and freedom and responsibility and family uh, and those sorts of things. And, uh, and that's what people ended up responding to. Um, I think, um, uh, I don't want to, it's a little bit of a trade secret and I don't want to give it away, but um, you know, all of the negative TV ads and the kind of traditional sort of uh, divide and conquer, depress the voter electorate, um, uh, you know, scare up uh, uh, perceptions of negativity about the opponent or the opposing view. Um, uh, that, that mode of campaigning just isn't working anymore. It's kind of a big waste of money. Uh, I think the um, successful uh, campaign, Obama campaigns for presidency kind of proved that. Um, they didn't spend a ton of money on those traditional forms the way our good friends, the Koch brothers, did in state after state after state. They really went right to uh, the individuals and tried to form those personal connections through a lot of technolo technology, but through a lot of shoe leather, a lot of door knocking, really, really old fashioned forms of campaigning. And to my way of thinking, um, that's the way to combat the 50 to 60% disaffection. It's the personal connection, telling the stories, dragging people to the polls, getting them engaged, and thinking about their lives and policies that affect their lives, and who's going to elect, be elected to represent them, and, and putting them in relationship with their elected representatives. So I, th you know, I might sound a little wide-eyed and optimistic and ideal idealistic, but, um, uh, but, uh, but I am. I really believe that, that there are great possibilities in our democracy through campaigns. Campaigns are about elections and you know, elections are about democracy. Um, the, the downside is entirely present and very possible and we saw that in, you know, in coming out of the Rove era um, that was very effective for some period of time. But I think, I think the public is getting really tired of it and really burned out and frankly they're not paying attention to those modes anyways. They're on their computers, they're talking to each other, they're doing all kinds of other things, they're not paying attention to some of that Koch, you know, Koch brothers version of, of camp style of campaigning anymore. Let me ask the two professors with these conflicts and debates and uh, polarization, if we want to use that term, and sorting and all of the various ways we thought about this that are happening in society. And Professor Wright identified, we could talk about this in a number of different realms, religion, uh, racial groups, and so on. Since we've asked our two guests to uh, essentially come clean about their industries and how they may be involved and how they may relate to this issue, what about the university? How does the university relate to this particular uh, question? Are we part of the problem? Are we creating some of the paralysis, more of the conflict? Do we see that as part of our job, in fact, to, to generate that kind of debate and, and discussion that may well lead to paralysis and uh, uh, lack of movement? I'll ask, pro oh, okay. well. I'll, ask, uh, I'll ask Professor Wright first, then. No, you can't both defer. <laughs> <laughs> Form of paralysis. <laughs> Well, I, as, a, as a teaching practice in my own classes, I routinely uh, set up polarities, uh, dialectics, uh, for students to uh, try to work through uh, without offering necessary, uh, necessarily any answers or resolutions myself, trying to get them to wrestle with the, the, uh, the conflicts of ideas, of approaches to unknowing and understanding along the way. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's just my, my own pedagogical practice of the classroom. If we're talking about the university institutionally, then we have a much more, uh, shall we say, troubled uh, terrain to address. Um, you know, universities, um, historically, um, have not uh, been, despite our, our um, primary our pretensions to the contrary, uh, been central engines of social change, political change. Right? And this is a matter, of course, of debate right? in the academy itself. But uh, uh, as conservators as opposed to, to innovators of, of, of political change. And uh, you know, in terms of my own area of, of interest and, and study, that has been manifestly clear, particularly in terms of, of African American history. And, political change involved, which the universities um, at certain key points have played significant roles, but the, in the broad sweep 
of time, um, have uh, had comparatively uh, limited roles in change. And this university itself, the history of this university, I myself played a, at least a small role in a, in a, in a sea change on campus uh, 50 years ago uh, that uh, challenged the university um, to alter long-standing practices that had operated for, on the campus for generations, and generations of exclusion of students of color from participation in the university life, from representation in the curriculum, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, it's, it remains a, a, a matter of, uh, of historical interpretation. But again, from my own vantage point, uh, the university is, uh, uh, the university's role, this university's role in that remains a troubled role. Professor May. <laughs> well, um, let me put on the optimist hat first, because um, I think there's good news and bad news. The good news is I think that the university can be, should be, must be part of the solution, not part of the problem, and that we do that through all of the things that you outlined in, in, your, in your statement of the road ahead. And I think that we, we are destined to be a, as, as a university and as a college, a force for positive good in the world. Um, and that should be our, our mission, our goal, and our passion. And I think, as Professor Wright was saying, you know, we all do this in our classrooms. I mean, one of the things, I'll wave the, the liberal arts flag a little bit, that uh, we can do that not every college can do, which is, we give, we can, I give tests where I give the students questions and I tell them there's no wrong answer. And they, they're flabbergasted. There's gotta be a right answer and a wrong answer. You know, they've been studying for that. No, whatever the answer you come to, you defend it, you support it with evidence and argument, that's, you know, that's your job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there are no right and wrong answers. Our job is to question, to question the questions, and to develop new questions every day, and to find our own answers to those. So, you know, I think that's what we do in the liberal arts. And I think all the talk about, you know, critical thinking and preparation for the world, it, it almost sounds like a cliche, but you know what? It's true. That is what we are about. That's what we need to do. That's the good news. And with all due respect, I think the bad news is that our university, like many universities and public education in general, has been put on the defensive. We are fighting for our lives. We are fighting for our resources. We are forced into becoming more and more corporate, more and more like the corporate world, which we should be a complete um, uh, answer to or alternative to. And um, the more we become like the rest of corporate world, uh, the more we're losing our, our focus on what we're about. So I won't say any more about that. We've been talking somewhat uh, generally about this question. Is there anything different? as you think about your answers to the various questions uh, that you've given. Does Minnesota look like the rest of the country, or do we see some things here that are distinct, either better, worse, than what we see generally around the country? Anyone want to dive in before I cold call? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will. Good. What the heck? And then, um, you know, we have a fourth generation Minnesotan at the other end here. And I'm a relatively speaking newcomer. I've only been here 35 years. <laughs> um, but I grew up in California and when I moved here, it felt like a different world. And I have to say, um, aside from the weather, which made it feel like a different planet from Southern California, um, I really did feel that there was a spirit of um, of identification, not just with the state of Minnesota, but, but actually with the university, a sense that, you know, a kind of ownership, a kind of pride, a kind of demand that the university speak for the citizens of the state, whether or not people actually had a connection to the university, it felt like it was their university. And I don't want to overstate 
um, this, the situation that I felt in California, because I grew up in the California public schools all the way through my PhD, the University of California. I never had the sense that Californians felt the same sense of connection to um, the educational enterprise, unless they were part of it. And then, of course, they did. But I think that there is a, I have felt it since I've been here, there's a unique opportunity that the university has to engage that spirit. And I think as people from around the world and other parts of the country have come in, if people from other immigrant groups and ethnic groups and racial groups and whatever have come in, I, I feel like, you know, there's still that desire to connect to the university. It is, it is a flagship, it is a magnet, and, um, and I think, you know, we, we can do more to build on that relationship that I, I think is, is really possible here. But I am a newcomer, and John is not. Elaine, has, I, I am a fourth generation Minnesotan. Uh, my father's family came from small towns in Kentucky not long after the Civil War, way out west to Minnesota, as my grandmother used to say. <laughs> and uh, they came with a little but the clothes on their back and a great deal of hope for what Minnesota might mean for them. And uh, they built uh, uh, new lives here, and their lives are connected with the university in, in significant ways. Both my father and my aunt were students at the university in the 1930s. Uh, got uh, degrees, uh, again, from the College of Liberal Arts on the one hand and from the School of Mortuary Science on the other. Um, but they were here at the university at a time when um, there were fewer than uh, 40 or 50 African Americans at this public land grant university, and when African American families in the state uh, did not send their children to the University of Minnesota uh, because they didn't want them to be isolated or humiliated. They were here at a time when African American students and Native American students were not allowed to live in university dormitories and were barred by. Uh, by the codes, right, from the, uh, being members of sororities and fraternities and so forth, and when athletes on the university's teams were routinely withheld from uh, athletic competition, when they uh, were in competition with uh, teams from segregated uh, schools in the South and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the attitude is filled in that regard toward the university with ambivalence as a consequence. Uh, my father uh, you know, believed that uh, when my own time came to choose a place to, to go to school, that and I was interested in engineering at the time, that uh, and there were no schools in any of the historically black colleges and universities that had an institute of technology like ours. And as he said at the time, again, my, I, I and your grandfather have been paying taxes all of our lives to the state of Minnesota to help fund this university. And, uh, Okay. Right. Um, at any rate, the, um, that's is going to be a part again of the, the history of this institution as well. I mentioned earlier that I was, you know, had a small role in the, in the late 1960s in um, helping transform practices on this campus, but uh, the takeover of Morrill Hall in 1969 was not the first. African American student group, the Council of Negro Students, sat in in Lotus Kaufman's office and in the midst, midst of the Second World War over this matter of Af African American students and Native Americans not being allowed to live in university dormitories. And the then president called them communists and had them summarily removed. Um, it's part of the history of the institution that's not well known. It's not part of the official documentations, either versions of the history of the university as, as current. So, but it's, again, it's, it's part of my informed and experiential uh, awareness Again, cold again from the four generations of African American family life here. Yes, Gar. Two guests in, in your world of media, campaigns and elections. Anything different in Minnesota, or are we reflecting what we see around the country? Well, there's one way that I think Minnesota is quite different from most of the country, and we're very fortunate, I think, in that we have much stronger local media than other parts of the country. I know. Uh, Occasionally, I, I hear from people who are not happy with the Star Tribune, my former employer, for one reason or another. But uh, I think the Star Tribune, t 
today is back to doing a, a good job. It had a very low point in around 2007, 2008. I think it's much uh, better now. And around the country, this is a much neglected subject that I think is important. Around the country, the metro newspapers in the United States are in deep trouble uh, financially. They have uh, been hollowed out in terms of staff and they are not doing much reporting at the local level and you know most city and county and even state agencies and legislature go largely uncovered because there are so few reporters working in local media and in this market we have the Star Tribune is unusually strong compared to other metros. Uh, Minnesota Public Radio is the strongest probably uh, radio franchise for news in the whole country and MinPost is probably the second strongest online uh, news site after the Texas uh, Tribune. So I think we have much stronger media. I think we have other strong civic institutions like the Citizens League and others that are, I don't see things like them in other states. So I do think there's some, uh, we have some advantages for having public dialogue and for understanding with just what's going on around us. Senator Dibble, our campaigns look like other campaigns or do we have something different here? Well, um, uh, I, I just know Minnesota, so I, I can't compare too much. I mean, I, I compare war stories with a lot of my colleagues from the National Conference of State Legislatures and um, the International Network of Lesbian and Gay Elected and Appointed Officials. But um, uh, from what I can tell, uh, uh, we are uniquely positioned as a place where uh, folks believe in the system, even when they're frustrated with the system, when they're pro, you know, for, I, I'm a great example. Um, so, you know, my coming of age and uh, my, my political awakening came in my college days and I was out in the streets protesting and getting arrested and uh, carrying on and making a big, uh, uh, you know, big flap about myself and, and, you know, my righteous indignation and fury. But um, it was actually a function of my love of the country and love of the system. So at the same time, me and my cohorts, uh, as we were protesting and, and carrying on and making a spectacle, um, we're also getting involved in precinct caucuses, a unique feature of, of political access and opportunity. A lot of people speak ill of the precinct caucus system. I actually defend it because I think we actually can, can draw together and make significant policy progress, even from a, a minority perspective, um, as opposed to a pure primary and general election system. Um, and we're engaging and in, in forming relationships with candidates and those who would purport to elect to represent us in our views. Um, and I see that time and again with new arrivals. Uh, you know, the Hmong community uh, formed and, uh, and, and found its, its footing and its voice and elected a state senator. I mean, that was incredible. Um, the Somali community that is now coming into its own. You know, uh, time and again, um, uh, uh, folks uh, get exasper exasperated and, uh, and, and um, engage and, and, and believe even more strongly that if they struggle, um, they will make more true the promises that they were told uh, at one time. At the same time, however, um, you, you see growing disparity. Like I said, we have some of the worst uh, racially segregated and economically segregated neighborhoods uh, anywhere in the country. So it's not a perfect picture um, that I paint. Uh, but, but, you know, organizations like the Citizens League, I mean, even over at the Capitol, I think the last couple of years are a, an incredible testament that when people show up at the Capitol, um, they make a difference and things happen. And it can even overcome the influence of, of big money. But then you also see, of course, a, a real meaningful engagement of the business community with the education establishment, with the arts community, um, with, with uh, local uh, activists and, and their elected officials. It's a place where folks kind of know each other, they're in relationship, they can make big things happen. Um, so I think, you know, I think things work pretty well in our country, in our, in our state for the most part. And, uh, you know, I don't know where that comes from, why we have that legacy, um, but, but we do. And, uh, you know, I think it was threatened for a few years when I first came to the legislature in 2000 uh, for a number of years. It seemed like we were becoming like the rest of the country. Um, and, uh, you know, people were kind of, I think one of the uh, uh, executive directors of one of our anti-tax, anti-public sphere organizations said, well, people just want to live in their cul-de-sacs and be left alone. Can't you get it? Uh, and I don't think that's actually true. Actually, when Walter, Walter Mondale, uh, in the aftermath of uh, having run for the Wellstone seat, commissioned 
some intensive research to answer the question, has Minnesota fundamentally changed? Is it like the rest of the country? Which would be a depressing answer if the answer was yes. And he found out there are some differences. Uh, things aren't like they used to be in Minnesota. But for the most part, um, the values that have been unique to Minnesota, um, you know, uh, an investment, a social contract, investment in each other's success, uh, prizing our natural resources, wanting to protect those, making sure we had a high quality of life, a high cultural life, um, uh, that sort of thing, we're still pretty much intact. Well, one other thing I would say that I think uh, is discouraging is for a state like Minnesota with all its advantages to have the uh, track record we have of disparities, particularly I think of as in K-12 education, uh, but in certain other areas as well, they're uh, among the worst in the country. and. Uh, you know, that's an awful thing to have to say about a state that, uh, you know, prides itself on getting a lot of things right. Well, we, no, go ahead. Yeah, but one thing, Joel, in terms of what you've just said here, and I guess we haven't addressed this as yet, but it does take us, take leave me at least, back to where we started, the questioning the question. Um, the, the concern about polarization in general uh, in society now, whether it's in the public or in the scholarly community. I mean, given what we know about the widening disparity in incomes, resources, in wealth in American families and communities over the co course of the last uh, you know, three decades, it would be counterintuitive not to expect increasing polarization. It would be counterintuitive not to expect increasing polarization. And you know, my own look, brief at some of the some of this, the work of some of the social scientists trying to address this matter, has has uh, made me wonder a bit about uh, uh, the the kind of historical perspective that's been brought to bear. Uh, this past year, I think it was the the Pew Research Company's uh, surveys that have massive survey, ten thousand adults, the largest in its history on this and this whole matter of of, of polarization, um, and. Uh, you know, focused on, focus on the years 1994 to 2014, a 20-year period. Um, but in terms of my own perspective on this scenario, if we, if we don't pay some attention to not simply electoral or ideological polarization, but to racial polarization and so forth, we don't get at or understand some of the underlying forces. From the vantage point, most African American historians that I'm familiar with, in part, trace the roots of contemporary political polarization to the mid 1960s, uh, to the election to Goldwater and so forth, and to the development of the Southern strategy that all Republican presidents have employed since that point in time. And Barry Goldwater, who uh, uh, who opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, versus Lyndon Johnson, who became its champion. That battle that took place then, at the passage of the Civil Rights Act of the mid 1960s, is what generated the realignment of the political parties and the strategy of again of in a whole series of republics from Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, and so on and so forth, to, to downplay or oppose civil rights legislation. Um, and to appeal to the former states of the Confederacy of the South for support, and the former Solid South became the basis of long-standing uh, strategy that indeed reconfigured the, both the Republican and Democratic parties. And uh, you know, that whole enterprise, if in fact our current discussions about polarization don't look back beyond 20 years, we won't have much sense about the historical genesis or or, or context of the current polarities. I mean, most of the, the arguments these days that, that I've seen that argue that it's a myth rely on distinguishing between polarization in our political elites amongst elected officials, party organizations, members of SIP and so on and so forth, and the general public. And the argument there is that we may have pulled strong polarization amongst the political elite, but amongst the public, presumably, there's a much more moderate consensus at work. But again, this, 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 this broader and older historical pattern has to be looked at and, and, and look back even further historically. The Southern strategy that was employed in the mid-60s there and that became standard Republican Party itself goes back to, Re to Reconstruction era, to a century earlier 
first employed in the wake of the 10-year experiment of reconstruction to try to, you know, to create the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments and to gen in, in a generally reconstruct a dem democracy for the ex-freedmen. Well, the Republicans uh, turned away from that agenda, made the compromise that, uh, that led to uh, the uh, withdrawal of federal troops from the South and returning the, 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 the former states of the Confederacy to the ex-Confederates, to the Redeemers, so forth, and that generated the whole system of Jim Crow that it took uh, another century to overturn. So, <laughs> I mean, there's a complex, in some ways, nonlinear cycle of events here that certainly African-American political historians have been paying attention to, but I don't see reflected much of the, of the, uh, the survey research or the discussion from other scholars at present. Well, we're going to have to stop our uh, discussion there. I, uh, I did say at the beginning that part of our purpose in having these conversations is for us to think about the kinds of grand challenges that we face, but to, before addressing the grand challenges, to think about some of the big questions that, and hard questions. That, uh, that underlined them. I want to thank our panel for doing an expert job in bringing those perspectives to us tonight. Thank you.